Okay, I got the signal, I can talk again. Thank you, good job. So, um, welcome everybody, thank you for being here, especially those who've come here for the first time. This is the Nevada County Tech Hub, and um, I wanna thank everybody who volunteered to run the virtual reality and augmented reality demos today. Uh, they're awesome volunteers who are excited about this technology and sharing this technology. So I hope everybody got to see, get, get some experiences. If you didn't, we have it often, let us know. We have meetups every other Thursday. Join meetup.com and come and join the VR meetup and learn more about it. Um, so NC Tech Connection, our goal is to promote and support and showcase the tech ecosystem here. And I always say technology is not a sector by itself. It is what provides services and solutions to every industry in the community. And that's what we hope to do. So that's why we're very excited to partner today with the Nevada County Arts Council. Um, Eliza Tudor is here. And uh, I want to thank you for bringing Bill to us and to our venue. Um, really quickly, we do, I'm sure a lot of you donated generously. Everything <laughs> here is uh, provided through um, grant money. So if you can contribute, that would be awesome. Food and drinks are allowed in here. Just make sure you take all your utensils with you when you leave. Um, and I'm gonna let Eliza introduce Bill and we'll get started. Thank you. Shavati, thank you so much. Um, can you all hear me from where you, my soft, gentle, sonorous English accent? <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of people to thank. The ERC, Nevada County Economic Resource Council, thank you for being such a willing, open, and fun partner. There's nothing like the connection for us between art and technology, so it's great to be here. Thank you. And thank you in particular to Nevada County Tech Connection and to Shivati for being such a sport and so gracious in everything she does. And as Shivati says, please continue to support NC Tech Connection and in this, in this circumstance, Nevada County Arts Council as well. So I just echo Shavati's words, give generously. We welcome you and, and give generously if you haven't already, which I'm sure you have. And moving on from that, I'd also like to thank Harmony Bookstore. Who's bought a book today? Wonderful. So that's about half of you. And for those who haven't yet bought one of Bill's books, they're on sale today. They're still in hard book. Harmony Books from Nevada City is here. Stacy will love to meet you in that fabulous overflow room that also has pizza and wine. <laughs> so thank you, Harmony Books. Um, just a quick word to thank Jordan for doing such lovely marketing and for being such a sport. I don't know if Jordan's here, but she was great. Um, and with that, I'm going to read an introduction to Bill because he is such a formidable person in the context of his own career and in the world at large, and especially through the publishing of his new book, that I don't want to get a single thing wrong. So Bill Kilday's 25-year career in technology and game marketing has centered on maps and augmented reality. He served as marketing director for digital mapping startup Keyhole and marketing lead for Google's Geo division during the launch of Google Maps and Google Earth. He is currently vice president of marketing for Niantic, a spin out from Google responsible for GPS based games Ingress, Pokemon Geo, and the upcoming Harry Potter Wizards Unite. <laughs> Woohoo! The youngest of eight children, Kilday was born in Houston, Texas, and now lives in Austin, Texas, which I just learned was the fastest growing city in the US, and we know why, Bill, with his family. And he says he has a terrible sense of direction, which we don't believe, because he found his way to us. But I'd also like to also welcome and thank Bill's mother-in-law, Robin, who's been just tremendous. She is the link. She's the reason that we're all here. Thank you so much, Robin. <laughs> and as, as I just mentioned to you on the way in, 
your son-in-law said that you are a creative genius. So I just wanted everyone else to hear that. <laughs> While it's still good. Um, we also welcome... Um, we welcome Bill's wife, Shelley, and his two beautiful daughters, Camille and Isabel. Welcome, Bill. Come on up. Uh, I guess I should speak into the mic, right? So... Uh, thank you all for having me tonight. It's a, it's a special treat and a treasure to be here. Nevada City is a place that um, is near and dear to my heart. I was married here at St. Canis Church 19 years ago with Robin here. I, get to, I have the pleasure of coming back to Nevada City uh, at least once or twice a year for this incredible, wonderful community, and it's such a great place to be here, and it's an incredible turnout, so thank you for everybody that's come out here tonight. I do, before we get started, I, wanna, I have a list of some people that I do want to thank especially. Uh, Eliza Tudor of the Nevada County Arts Council, thank you so much for what you've done to put this event together. Uh, Shivati Kark Pearl and, t and the Tectonic Tuesday uh, initiative and group here. Thank you very much. Jordan and Janet from the Nevada County Economic Resource Council. Uh, Stacy at Harmony Books, who is here, and I encourage you to support your local bookstore and um, purchase a copy that I'd be happy to sign at the end of the event. Also, John Gardner, who is one of my good friends from the Google Earth and Google Maps days, who is now living up here in Grass Valley, Nevada City. Thank you so much for, for coming out. John, and to, of course, Robin for helping to put this whole event together as well. So thank you very much for all of you that put this event on tonight. <clears throat> uh, so, so with that, I want to get started in base, the basic format of this presentation, which I've done a couple of times since the launch of the book in early June, is to roll through some of the slides and give you a bit of the backstory and show you some of the characters behind the creation of Google Maps and Google Earth. And so I want to get to that. It's about 20 minutes or so. And so I think what we'll do is we'll roll through that slide presentation and then um, after that, have a uh, Q&A session. But before we turn off the lights, I do have one thing that I want to do. I have this, uh, technolo this mapping technology that you may all remember, right? <clears throat> okay, so what are the, yes, when your battery goes dead, right, which you might still want to rely on. So I'm going to need two willing contest participants for this. Maybe somebody that was born, is there anybody... Uh, after 1998, one youngster in the crowd. Let's, uh, I saw him back there. I think he snuck out. All right, let's have um, uh, one of the VR guys or somebody from the, the younger crowd that might not have uh, experienced these as much as everybody else. And then somebody that represents from a generation that knows these well. Anybody want to jump up and learn how to do these again? Yes, Nick? Okay. So we're going to have a face-off, Nick and Dan, yeah. right? Have you guys ever used these, this mapping technology before? <laughs> right? When I was a Boy Scout, maybe. When you are a Boy Scout. Yeah. So we're going to have a... Oh. 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 <laughs> I have a dip, 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 man. Yeah. All right. We're going to do something that I like to call the uh, paper map folding contest. Uh, right? You guys remember this, right? So we're going to shake it out, shake it out. Uh, and if I were cruel, I'd ask you to try to find something in Ontario, um, one of the provinces, but I won't do that. You can tell this is from Robin, because it's from Quebec. <laughs> you can shake it out. And uh, Steph, you want to be the judge here? So the, the, the challenge She's here... Fine. She's all right. fine. All right, so John, are you unbiased? Yes, okay. I'm so now the challenge here, I'm going to give this away. I'm going to hand you your map, and you have to fold it the way that it was originally created. Oh, my God. Okay. Can they do it? What do you think? Okay, so the challenge is... It's both a uh, speed and a quality, right? So you got to get it done fast, and you got to get it done in the exact way that it came out of the box. And then whoever hands their map to John uh, wins, okay? 
And there oh is no God. prize, sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll do that now. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Let's do this let's properly. Okay, uh, on the count of three, let's do it all together. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, he's fast. <laughs> well, I hit it the job, I hit it the job. Instructions a little better. Is Hannah to John? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. All right. Now, trying to do it in a windstorm. Yeah, if you're a pilot, yeah. you're a car. Try and put it out. You ought to try it when you're flying. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the one of the. Well, one of the funny things about uh, being on the Google Maps team and uh, doing these presentations, somebody came up to me and said, how many marriages do you think that you have saved with this technology? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a, a lot fewer arguments over stopping and asking for directions after, oh, after the launch yeah. of Google Maps. Uh, so with that, I think we can take the, the lights down a bit, and I'll roll through. Uh, again, about, ooh, I have 55 slides, so we'll see how fast I can go here. So the, the road trip for me on the whole Google Maps journey starts by, uh, starts with meeting a guy um, back in 1985 at the University of Texas. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> this is the Cross Plains, Texas computer programming class that entered a competition uh, at Baylor University in 1984. Um, Cross Plains, Texas has a population of 893. Um, the gentleman on the left is named John Hankey. Um, and I am still working for John Hankey 33 years <laughs> after meeting him. Uh, but Cross Plains came in third in this statewide competition. So that's John. He's sort of the hero of the story. Uh, I meet him in 1985 at Jester Dormitory, population 3,200. Uh, so the dorm at the University of Texas was about three times as big as John's hometown. Uh, so uh, he and I quickly became fast friends. Um, and I end up working for him for basically my whole career. I am still working for John Hankey. Um, and he's sort of the hero of the book. Uh, two other characters that you meet in the book that are really critical in the creation of Google Maps is Brian McClendon on the left and Michael Jones on the right. <clears throat> They're at a company in the late 90s called Silicon Graphics. Does anybody know SGI or Silicon Graphics? Are there any SGI alums in the crowd by chance? No? Oh, there are? Oh, okay. Well, you'll know a lot about their um, sort of core technology that they worked on. Michael Jones here was a creator of something called OpenGL, which was a basic language that, um, you know, helped create the gaming industry, essentially. And uh, Brian and, and Michael left SGI in 1998 and formed a company called Intrinsic Graphics. Um, <clears throat> let me just sort of fast forward once. So intrinsic, intrinsic Graphics was basically trying to use ordinary PCs to do what could only be done with uh, very expensive high-end supercomputers. And so they created a demo of what could be done with their technology. Uh, and the, the company was called Intrinsic Graphics. And they created this demo that was based on a short film that was done in the 70s called The Powers of Ten. Who knows, has ever seen The Powers of Ten? Yeah. By uh, architects um, Charles Eames. Um, and and uh, this sort of was the seminal initial example of this notion of, it starts with this, this couple picnicking uh, at Grant Park in Chicago, and it zooms back out. Um, in order of magnitude, it zooms back out, and basically you're zooming all the way back out into space, and it, s it has this sort of stunning visual effect that um, Brian and Michael uh, essentially used to create this demo of what could be done 
using ordinary PCs. It could it could be done on the you know the million dollar SGI machines, but Michael and Brian were the first ones to do it on ordinary PCs. <coughs> um, the demo was so good, it had a problem. It was too good. Instead of people buying intrinsic software, they wanted to know more about the demo. The demo was, was more interesting than the intrinsic graphic software, which was supposed to be for game developers. And so the, the board of directors of intrinsic graphics said, hey, this is super cool, but you guys need to stop working on this because this is not your core business. And so Michael said, well, it's... So great, we know that it's had this incredible enthusiastic reaction. Can we spin it out as a separate company? Can we find somebody to come in and run this as a separate company away from intrinsic graphics? And so that's the start of uh, my involvement um, in the project. And, it, and um, here's the very first uh, sort of org chart of John Hankey on the top, and I'm over here as a marketing guy, and we're going to start a company called Earth.com. Uh, and he comes to Austin in the late 90s and basically shows me for the first time essentially what, what becomes Google Earth. <clears throat> Here's some early doodles from the early days. This is from April of 2000 in some, uh, a notebook that I had and some doodles that I'd done. Just a couple of things to point out how to this sort of interface here had a built-in Google search. Well, what's interesting about that is at this time, Google is about a year old, okay? So uh, we were already starting to think about um, what, could be, what could be created um, in those very early mocks. Here's some early, this is some early servers. Uh, the company uh, starts, it has very little money. We started the company essentially it probably in the worst time you could start. It was in the height of the dot-com uh, crash, and so that's when the company started. We had very limited resources, and so here's a, here's a server room with some of the early uh, uh, hodgepodge of devices that were keeping the system together, and the notion that we could create this huge database of imagery and sell access to it. Um, from 2000 to 2004, the company really limped along. It was really struggling. Um, it was a system that could only be used by really about 15% of the world's computers. So it, that's a hard sell when you want to like try to get somebody to use something and you can't get them to run it. Like, oh, go buy a new, go buy a new Dell computer and you can get it to run. So it was a hard thing. We went from market to market to market trying to find somebody that could uh, utilize this software. And so here's a typical trade show booth. We went to architecture shows. We went to, to USGS shows. We went to travel and tourism shows. We went to real estate shows. And we, that was our basic marketing strategy was to just go rent a booth at a, at a, a trade, trade organization, set up shop, and to try to sell to it. So... Real estate ends up being one of those markets that starts to take off. Um, but things are very, very tight. And by the end of 2002, the company had essentially run out of money. And so um, we were just about to close up shop, but we did this one deal with CNN. And that, this changed the tr financial trajectory of the company. In 2003, um, we did a deal with CNN and we couldn't get any money out of them. We're like, $350,000. They said no. Two fifty, dollars no. 100000 no. And eventually, they settled $75,000 to use our software on the air. But you have to do this one thing. <laughs> you have to put our URL up on the screen anytime you use the software. So this is a little later. This is keyhole.com, which we finally got the keyhole.com URL. It was originally earthviewer.com. Um, and in March of 2003... Um, the U.S. invades Iraq, and CNN essentially turns their channel with millions of users into an infomercial for our software. <laughs> you, have, <clears throat> you have Miles O'Brien for long periods of time just flying around Baghdad, uh, showing bomb damage, pointing out tanks, pointing out 
potential troop movements, showing what a building looked like one day and had this amazing thing where you could sort of slide an image from one day to the next day and you could see the change from one day to the next. And so we went from a company with very limited economic prospects to one that really just exploded in popularity. Um, and it wasn't just the war, it was basically any news event. Uh, CNN started using, uh, this was, a, this was a, uh, you know, a volcanic eruption. And so they en ended up using it for all sorts of different um, uses that we couldn't have expected. And so here we are, this is how things were done in the, in the early 2000s. There was, uh, this is Brian's wife in his car. Uh, over at Fry's Electronics, buying <laughs> buying more hard drives because we're trying to build up systems, trying to you know keep up with the demand. So <laughs> it'll happen. Is the so license plate? The license plate is it'll happen. I yeah, that's it. Brian's <laughs> license plate. <clears throat> um, so fast forward to 2004. The company is on solid enough footing that we're going to actually take uh, additional venture capital from Menlo Ventures, and there's a deal in place for us to um, take a Series B round from Menlo Ventures, but the deal sort of is delayed, and there's a scene in the book, this is the sports page on Shoreline, and this is the scene of sort of where I learned for the first time, John Hankey pulls me aside as we're heading into the sports page, and he says, uh, Google wants to buy us. Google wants to buy Keyhole. And so, I, you know, I can still remember it's sort of over there. And, uh, and it was just baffling because in 2004, Google didn't have any mapping product at all. I'm not saying it didn't have, you know, a bad mapping product. I'm saying it didn't, it didn't exist. There was no mapping product at Google at all. And so the notion that Google would buy a mapping company was just hard to fathom. Why would they buy a mapping company? What's the, what's the plan? What's the notion there? What's the, what's the concept? Which is kind of hard to, hard to fathom today, you know, like, well, of course it has Google Maps, but no, in, in, um, before February of 2005, Google had zero mapping products at all. The reason John told me this is because in the, in the parking lot, he had seen a bunch of Googlers in the parking lot. Google was about four blocks this way. Keyhole was about four blocks that way. And it was the day that they had announced the date of the IPO. So there was a huge Google celebration happening at the sports page that we happened to just walk in, into the middle of. And he needed to tell me about it before I ran into anybody. <coughs> Here we are waiting for the final documents to be signed for Keel to be acquired. And uh, some party pictures. <laughs> we had a good time. That was, those were some good days after the Google acquisition. So the, um, fast forward to uh, the Google years. Keyhole is acquired in October of 2004. Um, here's Larry and Sergey and Eric Schmidt. And it goes from a company that was sort of crawling across the desert with no resources to this embarrassment of riches. To this, like, <laughs> it was just a complete change of pace for us. Um, and it was, uh, you know, just amazing to be a part of. Um, here's Isabel, a very young Isabel, looking at a, at a Google Earth image. And so some scenes from the, the life at Google. Here's the pool at Google. This guy had the, either the worst or the easy or the, or the hardest job in all of Silicon Valley. He's the lifeguard that had to watch the two lap pools there. <laughs> <clears throat> scenes from the inside the walls. Here's Shelly and Isabel at a company picnic. So Marissa Mayer is, um, is certainly featured heavily in the book. Uh, Marissa is somebody that when we show up at Google, there's a bit of a turf battle between John Hankey, who I work for, and Marissa, who is running all of Google Search, uh, as to who would own this burgeoning new hot area of innovation. And so while they, you know, Marissa and Brett Taylor and many of the characters at Google didn't know much about maps, they knew Google and they knew how to get things done at Google. And so there's really a, a kind of a turf battle that erupts between um, Marissa and sort of Brett Taylor here, uh, who is a very young product manager on the Google team 
uh, around who's going to own this. Eventually, it ends up being John Hankey, and I end up continuing to work for John Hankey on maps, and he runs all of the Google Geo division with Brian McClendon for the next 10 years. But um, <clears throat> when we arrive at Google, the place is just filled with guys like Brett Taylor, who are just so smart, and they're so young. Brett is 24 years old at the time, but he, you know, he's graduated from Stanford with a computer science degree. He works for Marissa. He knows how to get things done at Google. He's smart. He's, you know, got a, he's kind of a force of nature with a loud baritone voice, and he just sort of owns a room. And you could tell, okay, this guy's going to go places. He's going he's gonna to be something. He's going to start his own company, and he's going to go big places. And he, he, he goes on to, um, you know, start a company that's acquired by Facebook. He becomes the chief technology officer of Facebook. He then spins out another company that gets bought for $750 million for, by Salesforce. He is now the chief product officer of Salesforce. So that building that you see in downtown San Francisco, this guy's at the top of it. So, uh, And here is the, here's the team on the day of the launch of Google Maps uh, in February of 2005. So this is uh, the small core team. Chikai Ohozama, who's a keyholder, Andrew Kermsey, Brett Taylor in the back. These are all characters that you meet in the book. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Google Maps actually launches without aerial imagery, and it, it was a very popular thing without aerial imagery, but once the satellite and aerial imagery gets added in, it becomes even, even more popular. Um, and so here's the original core... Uh, Google Earth team, and um, this is probably maybe about um, in June of 2005, as the team, um, so the core team, including some key holders and some folks that have been added, I'm at the very top there in the middle. Um, this is um, one amazing thing is about the story is that John Hankey, <clears throat> when Google, does, Google comes to Keyhole and says, we want to buy your company, John says something that is kind of unheard of in the tech community. He says, that's great, but if you're going to buy this company, you need to know that you're going to buy the entire company. You can't just pick and choose who you're going to hire. You need this whole core team. And it's, um, I'm very thankful for John, because the marketing guys are usually the first to go, right? <laughs> So um, that's, a big, that's a big thing for a CEO to be that loyal to the people that work for, work for him. Um, and I think that that sort of has returned in that the folks that work for him are also very loyal. I'm not alone in still working for John Hankey. Of the, of the people in this, this um, picture, eight of these people are still working for John um, many, many years later. So I think that's a big part of it, is sort of building that team of loyalists who will follow you around and be a foot soldier, whatever you go and do. This is on the day of the launch, <clears throat> day of the launch of Google Earth. Um, that on the day of the launch in June of 2005 is the entire Google company. So it was about 2,500 people. So everybody that was in Mountain View got out on the lawn. Michael Jones climbed up onto the top of building 43, took a picture, and then we inserted it into, into uh, Google Earth. We had a lot of fun. There were a lot of unexpected uses of Google Earth. Here's, uh, here's one that was really fun for me as a Texas Longhorn. I got to cr help create a uh, animation for the Jumbotron at the Rose Bowl. And, uh, and it showed uh, kind of in a looping way at the Rose Bowl with me and John getting to go. This is sort of the, the fun that comes along with it. Um, the Google Street View project was one that started um, to sort of map the entire world using these Street View cars. And this, to me, was this ridiculous notion that you could, like, hire people and drive these cars around the globe. You know, th there's six million miles of roads just in the United States, and there's, um, there's, you know, hundreds of these cars that are out today around the globe driving around, capturing, air, capturing street-level views of... Uh, our planet and trying to keep up with a changing world. They've taken these Street View cameras everywhere. 
So off-road, uh, <laughs> museums, indoors, et cetera. Uh, it sets off this sort of crazy thing <laughs> where you would see these incidents around the globe of Google where, where people would do all sorts of things, crazy things when you saw a Google Street View car. This is in Norway. Some guys in a scuba outfit jumped, uh, jumped up and started chasing the Google Street View car. <laughs> um, so this is all in 2006. And Google Maps and Google Earth do very well in those years of 2006 and 2007. And then in June of 2007, this thing happens, right? So um, <clears throat> this was transformative in terms of the usage of Google Maps and Google Earth. Um, the notion that you had this incredible device with all of these things that had never been done before, and Google Maps was just perfect for it. It was just the perfect use case. Google Maps went from being something that you used once or twice a week to being something that you used once or twice a day. And that's the way the patterns shifted immediately. Within 18 months, there was more traffic happening on this one device than on all other computers combined, all other devices mm -hmm. combined. Um, and that's when, essentially, it was on one network, and it was in the United States and a handful of other countries. There was more traffic coming from this one device than all other um, traffic sources combined. Uh, the project continued to expand to incredible uses in new places, including the Google Ocean Project to map the ocean floor. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, but with the success of Google Maps and Google Earth, and with the usage, uh, there cr it created this sort of success-failure problem in which it was actually too popular, and we started being charged so much money by all the road network vendors that it created this issue for John Hankey and the leadership team of the GEO division in which the road network providers, the actual companies that sort of draw all of the roads around the globe had consolidated down to two companies, Navtech and Teleatlas. And they were very happy with the explosion of popularity of Google Maps and Google Earth because it meant that they could come back to us and charge us more money every year. And it turned into a deal in which it, it started to be, you know, an, an inordinate amount of money that we could not afford to pay. And so... It, it um, really incented the use of something new and, or for Google to try something completely new. And that's what you're looking at here is a project that has gotten very little attention outside the halls of Google but is arguably the most ambitious technical feat that the company has ever undertaken. And it's a project called Project Ground Truth. Um, and Project Ground Truth was essentially the idea that Google, from scratch, with a blank sheet of paper, would redraw the entire surface of the planet. And um, it was a multi-year project. It is still going on today. This project today has about 5,000 people working on it. Um, and it is trying to keep up with what is a dynamic and changing planet. It is trying to draw the, map, draw the world and to keep up with it. Uh, this is one of the tools that they use internally called Atlas. <clears throat> and Atlas is a computer vision um, tool that is taking every asset, every photo that Google has, whether it be a satellite image or an image from a plane or an image from a street view car, and is essentially reading those images and p extracting out data from those images. So um, it's doing crazy stuff. It's pulling out uh, direction, directional signage. It's pulling out uh, speed limit signs. It's pulling out school zone information. Um, it is doing things like um, it'll look at a street in which you see cars going in what looks to be one direction on both sides of the street, and it is guessing that that is a one-way street. Um, so it is a very sophisticated 
analysis and computer vision tool at the heart of the mapping initiative. And it now, if you use Google Maps, it is at the heart of any of those services. All the data is now completely free and clear of any third party. It is all being mapped by Google. As an example of this, um, the, the road network providers did not allow Google to uh, speak out the street names when you were turning. So, you know, if you want to turn on Nile Street, it would say turn here. It wouldn't say turn on Nile Street, right? And so, you know, that's the, those are the kinds of restrictions that the data providers put onto Google that the company just couldn't live with. So this Ground Truth project is, uh, you know, it's just unfathomable in scale. Uh, there's there's 7,000 people on the Google Maps team today, 5,000 of them on this Google uh, Street View project, I mean, uh, ground tr project Ground Truth, to try to keep up with what is a, a changing place. Um, the other thing that happens is, any kind of changes that are being reported back to Google are being maintained by that group, and so they're using this tool to uh, swap in new data. Uh, and the Ground Truth Project is something that happens from 2008 until about 2012, before they launched um, uh, maps with the Ground Truth data. So John and Brian run Google Maps and Google Earth from 2004 until essentially 2013. Um, Marissa kind of comes back on the scene in the book. So essentially, she handles all of Google search, but a guy named Udi Mamber sort of elbows her out of Google search, and she comes back and she appears on the scene in the book and says, I'm here to run Google Maps and Google Earth, and sort of elbows out John and Brian. And so... Um, uh, she lasts for about a year in that capacity before leaving to become CEO of Yahoo. And uh, Brian, um, and so John had left the Maps team by then. Brian ends up running the entire uh, Google Mapping team after that. John leaves to found a company called Niantic. And it was, at first it starts with an uh, internal project to basically... Uh, address something that he had had issues with with his son, which is like a gamer that wants to be inside playing video games all day on a beautiful California day. And would you please go outside and play? Would you please go outside and play? And so um, they make a deal that essentially you can go outside and play. And for every hour that you're outside, then I'll let you play video games. And so he marries these two things together and creates this concept around location-based games, games that you have to get outside to play, GPS-based games, that the only way that you move in them is by moving in the real world. And it's a combination of his initial interest and love for, for games and his, his industry knowledge of maps. The first game is called Ingress. It's a strategy game, um, and it sort of does fairly well. It's good enough to get funding to start this, this next company, Niantic. Here's some of the events. That's in Tokyo. There's an event with 10,000 people at it. Um, who, these basically people are like walking, running, biking 10 miles a day to try to capture territory for their team in Ingress. And it's, it's a fun, it, but it's more of a strategy game. And it does fairly well. The next game up does really well. <laughs> so this is the launch of Pokemon Go two summers ago. So this line here, don't confuse this for an axis over here. This is the Google trend report. So this is the sort of interest in Google Maps on launch in the blue, Google Earth on launch in red, and then here was, here was Pokemon Go over here. <laughs> yeah. So it's, again, the concept is that in order to play this game, you, we can't play it here, right? You've got to get up off your chair, and you've got to go outside to try to catch these characters in the game that have been inserted into the world called Pokemon characters. So um, still a very popular game. Filters uh, onto the top of, of, of game charts every once in a while still. Um, my, my role as a marketing guy largely re revolves around putting on the events, um, 
And here's the book. There's a couple of shots of the book. Okay, so this is, uh, this is kind of a reunion of some of the keyhole guys that I did at Niantic. You can see how much John likes talking about himself <laughs> in the middle there. Yeah, Michael Jones, John, Phil Keslin, and Noah Doyle. These are all keyhole people that are now still involved in Niantic. It's, the book has been really a, a fun thing to be a part of. Here is, uh, I'm not making this up, this is the GOTUS. You've all, you've all heard of POTUS, right? This is the geographer of the United States. Lee Schwartz. There's only been nine in the country's history, and he is, he draws all boundaries and all borders that uh, are used by any government agency, including the military. I got to go to Uber, and, you know, that's one of the aspects of the story that um, a lot of people don't think about, is that Google Maps and Google Earth end up being the kind of foundation layer for a lot of new companies, a lot of new services. So, Companies like Uber um, and OpenTable and Yelp and Zillow. So, you know, anything that has a map, Hotels.com, anything that has a map associated with it, the maps and the Earth team end up um, sort of acting like an incubator for those companies. You sort of fast forward all of these services. For the first two years of the Google Maps API, Google didn't even charge for that service at all. So you had all of these new services that could, that could sort of explode onto the world because they had the ultimate base map that somebody else had drawn. Somebody else had done all that heavy lifting of creating these maps and then said, here, take them, do what you want with them, and they created their own services on top of those maps. So the Maps um, API ends up being a kind of a transformative thing for anything associated with location and geography including companies like Uber. Um, so with that, I think I'll stop there, and we can bring the lights up. And um, yeah. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to you guys and say, do you have questions? Yes. So uh, what about the other uh, mapping companies like Magellan and Garmin, do they utilize the route that you've done, or are there different? Well, the Magellans and the Garmins of the world, I'm speaking generally here, were the basic users of that same mapping data from Navtech and Tele Atlas, and so though, that was you know multi-billion dollar industry for those companies. And if you you know can remember in the you know late 90s, early 2000s, they were hugely popular. The Garmin Nuvi, I was a huge uh, um, user of it. They were using the same data. And so that's part of the reason why um, the, the Navtex and the Tal Atlases of the world didn't want to give data to Google Maps. And if they did, they were going to charge a whole bunch of money because they knew that if they did provide that data and allow Google Maps to use, to have some of those same road directions capabilities, it would really hurt those businesses. And so they were right in that, in the sort of the notion of holding that back. But that was the reason why those companies, um, you know, they held that data back from Google Maps because those products were, were hugely popular and hugely successful. They were great products. The problem was they weren't always on you. They weren't in your pocket when you needed them. So while they were awesome, they weren't always on you when you needed it most. They were in your car or in your, and you know what I mean? And so that's part of the reason why that Google Maps and products like it had such an advantage over, over them. Craig? So um, why did Google Earth drop the uh, photo layer? Um, that's it. <clears throat> so, no. It's uh, why did Google Earth drop the photo layer? So one of the things that happens in Google Earth is that because of its popularity, we had a lot of different uh, providers of various geographic data sets come to us and say, hey, we want to be in Google Earth as well. We want, that would be, there would be folks like the National, National Geographic or uh, Sierra Club or World Wildlife Federation. Um, and so there were, it sort of started out where there would, there would be these different layers that you could activate in Google Earth, including all sorts of different data sets, news sources, 
And the photos layer was one of those that you could basically um, turn on a, a set of, of photos of where you are and show that in Google Earth as a layer. And they actually bought a company called Panamaria, Panaramio to sort of fund that. And it's just one of those things that lost focus and lost attention of Google. Maybe it was the Street View project in which there was more money flowing there and this sort of like a comprehensive data set versus the more glamorous data sets of, of Google, of the photos layer. But it's, it's one of those things that, you know, as the, as the product moved more towards maps and less tar- towards Earth, that that just got deprioritized at the company. Yeah, that was, I mean, when I first discovered that, I yeah. was really mad. Yeah, was, yeah. I, I used that to plan trips to different parts of the world because those <laughs> photos were key yeah. to getting a, a bird's eye view of really the <clears throat> elements of the geography. Yeah, I agree. I think that um, the unfortunate thing about um, projects at Google in general is that you have the, the basically, what's the new hotness to go work on? In the, and sort of, you can imagine Brian and John, they create this whole thing and they're the early advocates for it. John buys the Panamario company that I'm talking about. Well, they start to, you know, they peel off of the project and you've got a whole nother set of people that are involved in it. Then they start asking questions about the long-term economic viability of this. Why are we spending this money on that data set? You know, do we really need to, somebody has to go justify it. Somebody has to like come in, you know, with a PowerPoint presentation about the usage of different features. You know what I mean? And so you can sort of see that if you don't have those early advocates who were the champions for it, then uh, you start to see some things die off. And in general, I, I hope that those things are kept alive, but Brian's not there anymore. John's not there anymore. The sort of original visionaries behind much of that stuff have sort of peeled off to new projects. I would suppose that the military and the Defense Department would be very interested in this kind of technology. Very much so. And so that's uh, uh, something I didn't touch on, but it's certainly a, a key component of the book is that Keyhole also sells to the military and the intelligence community. And so they use um, the Keyhole software and platform with their own imagery, which, by the way, happens to be a lot better than we had access to, and uh, use it for their purposes. And so uh, military intelligence community, uh, National Geospatial Agency, those were all huge advocates and users of the product. It's sort of a funny component of that, which is that was something that had sort of drug along as a deal. We couldn't quite get them to buy the tool set. And then the war happens and you have Miles O'Brien on the air using this thing and you have people all through the military industrial complex saying, why the hell don't I have that on my desk? (laughs) And so uh, we ended up having a lot of people that were just like signing up um, individual soldiers that were being deployed off to Afghanistan or wherever were signing up and buying licenses to sort of explore that where they were going to be shipped it's off to. Marketing to start a war. That's just really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, uh, yeah, I don't recommend it as a marketing tactic, but uh, it. Um, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was hard. I mean, it was a weird thing, right? It was. Uh, you know, without getting into politics, it was not a thing that I agreed with doing, yet our company benefited financially greatly from it. So it was kind of a kind of a hard, you know. Terry. When you guys were first getting started, pre keyhole and John first thought of this, this seems to me it's largely, or at least a great part of it, it's a data aggregation issue. Yeah. What, what made you think that there's enough data out there and we can get it and we can put a, when was the, the, when the light bulb came on and you thought that, that this was a doable problem? Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have been doable without a lot of things kind of converging all at the same time in the late 1990s. So our timing, I talk about starting in the dot-com crash was bad. There were a lot of things that worked in our, in our favor. And one of the things was that It was only in the um, early 90s that the U.S. government allowed 
well, GPS is one aspect of it, but I was going to say is the remote sensing so that commercial satellites could be launched. And so a group of folks that were working on uh, the Star Wars initiative peeled off of that, went and founded two companies called Space Imaging and Digital Globe. They launched satellites. And so starting in the late 90s, there's now these commercial satellites that hadn't existed before. So you had data sets from... You had sort of the starts of it, though. You had NASA that was capturing imagery from the space shuttle, this beautiful data set called the Blue Marble data set, largely used for scientific and environmental sciences uses. Um, you have also, at the same time, aerial imagery being captured by uh, county tax assessor collectors. So this is a funny thing that happens where basically a county would pay to have their area flown, and they could do all sorts of uses with it, land use planning, forestry, uh, road networks, utilities, emergency planning, plat maps, and taxes, and and watching basically their land to say, hey, you know what? It looks like you put a pool in last last year. So uh, you you know here's your tax bill this year. You know you go in to argue. It's like uh, my house not it's not worth that. You know like actually it looks pretty nice from here where I'm sitting. And so the tax assessor collectors ended up paying for those things to be flown, guess what? That was used with taxpayer dollars. So, hey, we, you know, we should have access to that. So we started aggressively contacting those tax assessor collector uh, in those counties and requesting um, access to that data. And all we would have to do is pay for the reproduction costs, the CDs that would come in. So they would ship it to us, and then we would import it and then create it. And, and what was funny about that is that they would turn around and become customers of ours. Yeah. They would turn around and say, oh, I love this. How do I get this? How do I, you know, this happened in the um, in, uh, city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where it's like beautiful imagery. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. We pay like $14 to get the CDs <laughs> imported in. And then we had all these like police officers, uh, you know, subscribing from the city of Cambridge for, uh, to access data that they already had. But our platform was much easier to use it with. So... Uh, John Gardner. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Um, this brings back a lot of memories for me. Yeah. All things we worked on. You know, I started reading your book. I got to page 75 or so, but then I stopped because uh, you didn't mention me once. So, two points. Um, it was interesting you mentioned about the acquisition of Keyhole and how. Um, John Hankey had advocated that it was all or nothing deal with the right. staff bringing them all in. Um, because I had a friend who worked in, in Google at, uh, in M&A, and he yeah. said almost the exact same thing to me like eight years ago. He yeah. said, you know, that John Hankey, he's a good guy. He, yeah. he insisted that they all be, be brought in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And the other thing about all this is it, you made that point about how it was a big deal when, when Maps was brought into the iPhone. Mm. And I, it, that can't be under underemphasized because, mm. you know, I, I don't know. With technology, we take these things for granted after a while. That you know, mm. I can pull out this phone here, and I can open it up, and I can I can go to the Himalayas, or I mm -hmm. can go to Cambridge, or I can go anywhere else and see this stuff, satellite imagery in 3D, and you know. But you know, we can just look at this and say, oh, well, that's so yeah. 2008. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty. It's it's incredible. It really is. It really and is. It's uh, it's magic. It's really just you know, you've got this supercomputer in your pocket now, and the things that are going on behind the scenes to make that what looks so simple to you. You know, uh, let's try in the back. Um, I noticed that uh, Google Maps in the menu takes uh, Ingress and Pokemon Go games are really projections, uh, 2D projections of the world onto a sphere, right? There's no real concept of elevation, and you can't, you know, I have, even the indoor navigation is in you know, places like airports, which are typically single story. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, you, there's problems with getting GPS elevation to work <coughs> indoors and things, but it's, I'm, I'm wondering if, is that just too te technically difficult to have the real 
3D multi-level, multi-layer stuff, or is there no customer demand for it, or is, or is it something else? Because when I started playing Doom, mm -hmm. that was the, you know, the first game that it made a bazillion years ago, it mm -hmm. seemed like it was 3D, right? But it was the same thing. It was mm -hmm. a place where two levels crossed over each other, even if thinking about going up and down. And with mm, the upcoming you know, Harry Potter game, it seems like you might want to be able to experience a more 3D world than just the 2D projection of like towers and things and stuff. Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting thought. I don't know a lot about that space, um, but I know more than most of the people in this room about it. <laughs> so I'll make up some stuff. No. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, you think about a location, and it's a latitude and a longitude, and it's an X and a Y, and there's sort of two dimensions to it. There isn't the sort of Z factor to sort of make it a three-dimensional location as well. And so, yeah, I mean, location in skyscrapers, buildings, uh, uh, you know, above ground, that's, that's a harder thing to do because uh, I think that that data isn't just out there to be licensed. Like, you know, like, oh, well, actually that, you know, you're, you're at that intersection, but you need to be, you know, 800 feet up. That, that database doesn't exist. That's not out there. I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff about that problem, though, and people trying to solve it in terms of, of you knowing where you are elevation-wise mm -hmm. uh, that involves all kinds of crazy sensors, barometric p pressure, and all sorts of things to try to detect um, where you might be. I have a friend who works on um, a project related to selling concessions at stadiums in 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 seat delivery of uh and so you, you know where are you detecting where you are and knowing where that is is pretty you know are you on the third level or on the first level where's that beer going to you know and so and so there's a lot of people that are trying to kind of figure that out but i don't know what sensor in your phone that would ever get you to the elevation level to to um to get there. I mean, yeah, it's an area of exploration. I don't know. Somebody who's so smarter than me is probably working on it. Yeah. Um, oh, you want to answer that question? Yeah. Uh, well, you can, you can track basic um, elevation information from GPS, but because of the error rates and basic trigonometry, it's basically got too much error to locate you within the space of a single story. Like, never mind the fact that you're already indoors, and of course, that already introduces errors. Uh, depending on the material of the building, but also even if you were like just at a point in space, like you could get your latitude and longitude within a meter from standard issue GPS, but you might only be able to get your elevation within 10 meters, and that's not sufficiently accurate to have utility. Right, the beer could still go to the wrong seat with 10 meters. <laughs> I want let me just add on one other one other technical prospect for that is um, something that is called um, VPS or Vision positioning system and it's something it's sort of a new thing that's emerging in which they're positioning based on all of the world's photographs that are being taken so you imagine the sort of like mm -hmm. photograph of all these different locations they know the gps is and they're recognizing that this is what this painting is imagine a, a painting on the third floor of a museum and so you've got you know everybody's taking a picture of the mona lisa that's on the third floor and and google has captured all of that in their using that to basically detect, oh, you're in front of the Mona Lisa now, and we know that that's on the third floor, and so we move you up to this elevation. So there's this pathway here that involves computer vision technology to get possibly up off the ground as well. Okay, so is there a process where, for disaster areas like the fires in California, uh, the floods back east, where we can get um, uh, updated um, Earth views, satellite views, faster than the the typical. Um, uh, I don't know what yeah. how you plan that, but is right. there a way to do that? Um, yeah, it's it's a area that has probably evolved from when I was at Google. So I'll say that what I know about it might be different than the way that it is today, but. Um, and it's part of the book, and there's a story of our, the MAPS team response to Hurricane Katrina being the sort of first time in which we were asked to update the imagery in near real time in order to provide um, 
the emergency response personnel a better view of what was happening on the ground. And so that was a sort of rush emergency experiment that brought together the National Oceanic Administration, uh, NASA, and the Coast Guard to basically fly New Orleans and to update that imagery in Google Maps. And so that ends up, it's a, probably my favorite story in the book is the story of the Hurricane Katrina relief. It's, it's still one that I'm super proud of to have been a part of that. But there is now a more coordinated team effort at Google to respond to emergencies. The next one up was Haiti, I believe, the um, uh, tsunami in uh, Sendai in Japan um, and many others that I'm, you know, I'm going to forget. So, but basically there's now a team, a crisis response team that, that is assigned to respond to emergencies. And I don't know, you know, sad as it sounds, the fires in California are just sort of like a part of the new normal now. Like when does that a trigger an emergency response in a flyover? It's sort of like, it would be like, it would be every day, you know? Yeah. And so I don't know what that threshold is, but I imagine that there's some decision tree at Google to say, when do you fly, when do you fly the planes? When do you uh, have this, you know, satellite reposition? There are, Google now owns its own satellites, now owns its own planes, and so Can they have the ability to... that with drones? Probably. You just add that to the Somebody told me that Google, that Apple Maps is using drones now, so I didn't, yeah. I didn't, it was a new one on just me. another tool. Another tool, yeah. Oh, one last question? All right, I'll go for, I'll go for Nick and then Catherine. Nevada County is not interested in acquiring any more roads. There's lots of roads in Nevada County that are not part of the county road system. Since counties are providing data to Google Maps and so forth, why do so many people still end up trying to drive through the cow pasture? Oh, yes. <laughs> because they think, because Google Maps tells them they can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you correct errors? What do you do? Well, there is a team. I mean, that particular one, I don't know. I think that there's probably, there is the sort of in the desktop version of Google Maps, the report a problem functionality. And so um, that, as I understand it, is a database that is that is maintained on a uh, zero bug basis, meaning that they respond to, if they're going to make that change, that they make that change on the day that it's reported. Um, but there might be other reasons why. There might be somebody else with a different perspective saying that it actually is a needs ingress, egress for emergency purposes or something along those lines. I can't, I don't know about the very specific uh, road network uh, <laughs> issues, but they're, yeah, it's, it's uh, thousands of people that are working on that, trying to keep up with the changes, and um, it's, a, it's a tough problem. The world is a changing place. Catherine. So my question was, is there how much cooperation or competition there is between Google Maps and Apple Maps? huge competition between the two. So um, that is a very contentious thing that sort of I started to see the, the very initial uh, sort of volleys of that. You know, quickly, Steve Jobs uses Google Maps, but probably within two years, Apple is working on their own maps. Um, and uh, that didn't go so well for them at the launch. And it uh, resulted in the loss in uh, many billions of dollars in market capitalization for Apple. Uh, the loss of many jobs at the very highest levels of their software teams. Um, so, but they've responded well and are have a very competitive offering now. I, what I would say is that Apple is more reliant as a strategy on third-party providers and the sort of typical road network providers um, versus Google. They don't have the 7,000 people working on it. Um, so I think there's still probably a... Um, a quality margin between the two products, probably, uh, but that's been lessened over time as Apple has has caught up. It's a good it's a good product now, but it's not Google Maps. <laughs> I am. I should also. Um, uh, Stacy with Harmony Books is uh, hopefully still here, yes, and so yes. if you would like to purchase a book, I'd be happy to sign it. And uh, thank you again for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.
So Bill is going to hang around. You guys are welcome to chat with him and get your books signed. Um, and don't mind us as we start removing the chairs from under you. No, we won't do that. Uh, but if you want to know of more events like this, we hold Tectonic Tuesday on the third Tuesday of every month usually. So join us on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, nctechconnection.org is our website. Thank you for being here.